خدا ہو شامل استاد ہو عامل شاگرد ہو کامل میننگ گاڈ مسٹ بی پریزنٹ دا ٹیچر مسٹ بی اے اسکالر اینڈ دا اسٹوڈنٹ اے ڈیوٹی ہیلو My name is Suhail and I am a PhD candidate at Wesleyan University's music department. My research focus is Sarangi and its practitioners. So Sarangi is an Indian bowed North Indian classical instrument and I belong to a family of hereditary Sarangi players. In today's presentation, I will discuss a chapter from my ongoing dissertation and this chapter is titled as the ritual poetics of rag from the mystical to the worldly although the influence of mysticism can be found throughout india sarangi players developed a particularly deep connection with mystics and mysticism Their association with the ineffable was believed to give their music an efficacy that could transcend the everyday. However, the revivalist Indian musicology that came out in the 20th century added many layers of complications. I will argue that while spirituality among Sarangi players may be indescribable, it is not inaudible. and remains powerful. In the last two centuries, scholars have researched Hindustani music from the context of aesthetics and theory. But less attention has been given to the mystical phenomena that constitute a crucial part of this music system. So while keeping the focus on Sarangi players I adopt a phenomenological approach to study the various types of mystical experiences associated within the lives of Sarangi players and just to be clear um I am mainly focusing on Sufi mystical experiences so Sufism is this uh Islamic form of mystical practice and this process of mine is is carried out uh with the help of an auto ethnography that draws on my own 25 years experience of being a student and a performer in hindustani music although one of many husserlian definitions of phenomenology demands focus on things themselves in a musical context these things exist within a subjective consciousness Another definition is understood as an experience that is sedimented in the human body within a cultural and a social context. So therefore to me this approach helps to understand uh, the subjective aspects of Sufi mysticism. Therefore I use ethnographic research to uncover subjective traces of this ineffable long history of Sarangi culture practices. My ethnography consists of various documented and previously undocumented case studies and therefore it addresses issues that were raised by other ethnomusicologists but left unresolved. So India is a land of uh, many religions and and kind of practices a variety of spiritual and religious practices and they kind of coexist together uh, all across the subcontinent and um, these practices can be seen in people's daily lives in their culture uh, in their traditional rituals but interestingly the relationship of music uh, with spirituality and religion is particularly multifaceted and complex Although both spirituality and religion are vast topics and complicate music theoretical explanations of Hindustani music it is crucial to understand how sarangi plays relate to them ethnomusicologist and musicologist uh, you bore uh, featured early 17th century mughal manuscripts and images 
that reveals Sarangi's connection to the mystics. Although these paintings or manuscripts fail to clarify that the Sarangi players were also mystics, um, or were they not, but what they do is, uh, they do kind of inform us about how Sarangi players were an integral part of this culture, of this tradition, of the process. Uh, for example, in this particular uh, image um, of a dancing Sarangi player um, who's accompanying a dervish uh, uh, getting into a spiritual ecstasy while recentering the role of Muslims in Hindustani music. Historical ethnomusicologist Catherine Schofield reveals the combination of systematized scientific knowledge and the presence of spirituality that led to revelatory experiences in music performances at the Mughal courts. Shofield's research also suggests that musicians' practice in the Mughal era had the power to bring rag energies out alive, sometimes giving them almost human-like forms. There is a very interesting story uh, Shofield narrates, uh, and this story is retrieved from um, 1750s canonical Mughal writings based on music in Shah Jahan and his son Aurangzeb's reigns. The tale attests to the personification of frogs at Shah Jahan's court, and this is how Catherine Shofiel describes it. Court musician Kushal Khan, great grandson of Than Sen, sang through the gentle mood of love and adoration. This is one Ra gradually took on her personified shape until she stood before the assembly like a delicate woman wearing a white sari with camphor flowers and saffron on her body. Standing in front alone, playing her instrument and pacifying the gazelles by her feet who are listening with joy to her music. And there are other ethnomusicologists uh, such as Bonnie Wade and Dan Newman which talks about the supernatural phenomena and uh, the amazing uh, miracles that happen uh, in the Mughal court music performances. Uh, and Than Sen, one of the most important figures in Hindustani music, uh, is the key figure to that. So Sarangi player Nanni Sufi is a fascinating case study for me and uh, there has been almost no documentation uh, can be traced about him. Uh, Nanni was born and lived in Muradabad which is situated in the state of Uttar Pradesh. He was born in the mid 19th century and exact dates are unknown. He was a hereditary Sarangi player and a practicing Sufi um, who later received the title of Jadu Gire, meaning the magician. The legend goes that when he played the tappa on his Sarangi, even the Metrani, which is a term for a low caste unteachable who has no musical education, froze and was spellbound by his Sarangi playing. So I'd like to stress upon uh, the style of song he played, the tappa, which are extremely complicated, uh, fast in nature songs. And as the name suggests, uh, tappa, which is derived from the Hindi word tap, meaning to bounce, uh, you as a practitioner are not allowed to stand or, uh, or, or rest rather on one note, but you are expected to be constantly bouncing so for example if i if i if i give you an example um, it will sound something like this oh <laughs> Mia 
नवे जाने वाले हे सो इट इज एक्सट्रीमली कॉम्प्लिकेटेड एंड एंड फुल ऑफ दीज मेलिजमाज एंड 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 वेरी इंट्रिकेट न्यूंसिस ऑफ हिंदुस्तानी म्यूजिक विच अनस एंड एंटिल यू हैव सर्टन काइंड ऑफ नॉलेज यू वुड अंडरस्टैंड दैम सो दैट्स वेयर द मेटाफर ऑफ ऑफ टप्पा इज काइंड ऑफ यूज हियर इन दिस लेजेंड दैट दैट he that nanne sufi was playing the tappa and even the tappa uh, had so much of affect in in his playing that even a pair of untrained ears were were captivated by his music so nanne sufi's story to me resonates with french philosopher jean nancy's discussion on phenomenology um where he says phenomenology of sound is not merely acoustic phenomena but it has a resonant meaning and that meaning is all about sounding and resounding in the subject and back to itself furthermore he uh, nancy also posits that listener as a resounding chamber in a resounding world is making sense of inside and out of self and other of singular and plural so this concept of inside and out kind of for me stands similar to the zahir batin concept the esoteric and as as esoteric and aesthetic uh, concept in sufism um to me the the story of nanne from a sufi point of view corroborate the real tasir which is a terminology uh, for spiritual feeling and asr which is a terminology that explains affect both these terms are heavily associated with sarangi blaz and sarangi blaz lives and their lifestyle uh, in addition uh, these two terminologies also align with nancy's discussion on resonance and resonance is the key feature of of music uh, and especially for sarangi because when you have 40 sympathetic strings trying to resonate um in a chamber for a listener you're constantly in a spellbounding affect of the player there are many other examples uh my chapter discusses and uh, these examples um also discusses the supernatural power um these practitioners had in their music and uh, one other example is um a legendary uh, sarangi name uh, bundu khan who was a descendant of uh, delhi gharana gharana is a terminology for music schools um and this particular music school claims its affiliation with sufi poet philosopher Amir Khusro who uh, just like Tanzain is an another um important figure in the Hindustani music so Bundu Khan has been uh, widely discussed in uh, ethnomusicology um uh, Daniel Newman talks about him uh, in his uh, research Nicholas Magrill talks about him in his research but not everyone has been persuaded um uh and in fact there is this one particular story which Dan Newman uh has mentioned um about uh Bundu Khan uh taking the sarangi for practice uh to his bed um uh, has been uh, criticized um in the field and on that note i'd like to say um uh, that the truth value of these stories is a much more complicated um case then it first appears uh whether they are true or false is uh, according to me is not the point well the point is that these stories have survived through the great oral culture in india and the fact that they have survived and were then mentioned by scholars is um, an evidence enough to prove their importance in regards to bundu khan taking the sarangi to his bed um uh, 
Well, in this story, there are various hidden connotations uh, that can be read between the lines. Um, for example, what does it mean that Bundu Khan is going to bed with the Sarangi? Is it um, eroticism? Is it mysticism? Or is it some kind of a psychotic behavior? Um, but that's where the discipline of ethnomusicology comes into the picture. As Bonnie Wade in her SEM's 2019 annual conference speech said, we ethnomusicologists are trying to learn about music through the social behaviors of living cultures. This is what the discipline should do. Uh, and according to me, we as ethnomusicologists are amplifying the unheard and transmitting the lost and putting a spotlight on the neglected. American ethnomusicologist Stephen Blum wrote about the use of uh, historic tales in ethnomusicological research. Uh, he says, um, scholars no less than other humans are spinners of tales who operate under certain sets of constraints and must choose from among the available narrative strategies or else devise new ones. One of our responsibilities is the historical reflection on how the narratives we offer as speakers and writers relate to those we've encountered. So resonating with Stephen Blum's quote, I would say um, these stories uh, or any historical stories are, are crucial to the field and, and, and very important to ethnomusicologists to, to research upon, to learn from and uh, to shed light upon it. In the end, I would just like to say um, that for people disillusioned with formal institutionalized ideas, sarangi players through rag music offer a seductive spirituality in which not only religion, but language, the arts, and potentially all domains of life seems to be infused with a power that is indescribable, ineffable and in a word, spiritual. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much for tuning in. Those of us from the graduate music department here at Wesleyan, both in ethnomusicology and in composition and theory, are very excited to have you watching so that we have the chance to share the research and new music and theoretical problems that we've been working on with you. My name is Garrett Grosbeck. I am an incoming second year master's student in the ethnomusicology department, but uh, previously, I studied music composition and theory uh, in Japan as a Japanese Ministry of Education scholar, and I've been very lucky to play a traditional Japanese instrument called the koto for 10 years. So since coming to West, I've been doing research on the educational structures around the koto and the way that it's transmitted in Japan. Uh, I've also been very lucky here at West to join the Chinese ensemble led by our recent graduate of the uh, ethnomusicology program, Joy Liu, who is a fantastic director. And as part of that ensemble, I've been playing the Gujang, which is actually a Chinese relation of the Koto, so to speak. Um, they both have kind of evolved from a common ancestor. And one thing I've been thinking about, particularly this summer, is how we ethnomusicologists, coming from a relatively little known field, can make the things that we're doing and working on and studying more accessible to people. 
So I've made a video comparing the Koto and the Gujang uh, with a mix of audio, some of the sheet music, and what the instruments themselves look like, and also the way that they're played. Uh, back when I was in composition and theory, when I started writing music for Japanese instruments, even though I had been playing the Koto for a few years at that point, my first thought was to kind of treat the instrument the way that I would a piano and to think, how can I make this do what I'm used to a piano or orchestral instruments doing? Um, but the more that I've studied Japanese traditional music in particular, I have learned more about all of the different interesting techniques and compositional approaches and melodic ideas that are unique to Japanese classical music. And so I wanted to give an introduction to both the koto and the gujang that not only tells you about the physical qualities of the instruments themselves, but also a little bit about what kind of music has been traditionally written for them in China and Japan. It's a pretty big topic to cover in one 15 minute video, but I hope that you guys enjoy this introduction that I give. And if you have any questions, I hope that you feel free to contact me uh, and to participate in the discussion. Uh, so thank you guys. And uh, here is my comparison of the Koto from Japan and the Gujang from China. So I wanted to do a comparison between the Gujang and the Koto, uh, because I think it's really interesting to look at the different qualities of these instruments and also the type of music that's been written for them. Even just based on the sound, you can already hear there's something very Japanese about the Koto. And this is actually the go-to sound in Japanese TV shows when producers want to evoke this image of traditional Japanese culture. So I'm going to talk about a few of the differences between the way these instruments have developed over the years and what's interesting about the music that's been written for them. When you look at the historical tradition of Japanese music for the koto, there's a lot of really interesting things that might not even occur to us composers to put into our work because we've never heard them before. Um, and especially comparing with the gujang, you can see a lot of what makes the koto unique and also what makes the gujang particularly stand out as a Chinese instrument. So I wanted to start with just a comparison of the two instruments. You can see just from appearance that they clearly are related, although they have diverged and evolved in different ways since their common ancestor when the koto was brought from China to Japan. One of the most noticeable differences is that while they both used to be strung with silk, the gujang nowadays is strung with uh, metal strings wrapped in nylon and combined with the thicker, more resonant body. This gives the gujang a really resonant and full round sound. They also have included tuning pegs here at the end of the instrument to make it easier to restring and tune. The koto, on the other hand, still uses a pretty traditional method for tying and holding the strings in place and until very recently the koto community tended to be quite traditional and prefer silk strings uh, but in the late 20th century there's been a shift made to nylon and you can hear uh, from the tuning of the koto that it's a very di dramatically different sound from the gujang uh, also, the fact that these traditional methods of wrapping the strings are still used with the higher tension nylon strings mean that the instrument tends to actually warp over time. So you can see that the stand I have it sitting on here has adjustable pegs so that the height of it can be raised or lowered depending on how warped the instrument is. And just by a direct comparison, you can see that these two instruments that started off so similar have come to sound pretty different in the 20th century. Uh, you might also notice the shamisen in the background. Uh, koto players typically have to learn the shamisen in order to perform traditional classical Japanese music, uh, of which the shakuhachi is also a member of the ensemble. The bridges on both of these instruments are removable, but having the tuning pegs on the gujang makes it a lot easier to fine-tune the instrument. Uh, but being able to remove the bridges of the koto makes them a lot more transportable. Quite a dramatic uh, extended technique we can get from snapping those strings. 
So the koto actually originally arrived in Japan from China as part of the Gagaku Ensemble, which is the large ensemble associated with the Imperial Court based in Kyoto. And even today, if you go to a Gagaku performance, you'll see the koto performing with the yellow silk strings uh, and using a very different playing technique. Although there are some performing techniques in contemporary koto music that are associated with the gagaku. Originally, the koto would have used uh, tunings that were much closer to probably what you would hear on the gujang or in Chinese music. If we take away the half steps, they give it a very Japanese sound and retune the koto a little bit. It's pretty easy to make a uh, tuning that sounds a lot closer to what you can hear on the gujang today. But aside from the tuning, the shape and style of the koto actually hasn't changed a great deal since it was first brought to Japan from China, which is interesting because the name of the gujang, when you write it in Chinese characters, actually means old koto or old jung, and koto is just written simply with the character jung, even though this instrument is much closer to its historical shape. The koto was reformed slightly during the Edo period when it was changed from a gagaku instrument to be used as a more popular instrument that was favored by the elites and by wealthy patrons in Japanese society. There is evidence of the koto being performed just for amusement, uh, even as early as the tale of Genji, but we don't have a lot of historical information about what those pieces would have sounded like. So if we look at the koto sheet music, you can see that the vocal melody is typically written next to the melody of the koto, and it's written with these kanji numbers, which are pretty ancient, and there's evidence of similar sheet music or notation being found in China. Uh, the numbers indicate which string to be played, and then there are embellishments and ornamentations written with other Japanese characters, katakana or kanji, and the melody of the vocal line written in hiragana. One thing that's frequently misunderstood about the koto is that the vocal line is actually very important. Along with the shakuhachi and the shamisen, the koto part and the vocal line form part of this complex melodic interplay between all the different parts. So... This is definitely not something that we would hear in gujang music. Although gujang was historically used as an accompaniment for dance or for other kinds of singing or music that was uh, played for entertainment. So I'm taking a minute to switch my picks. Uh, the gujang picks are actually taped on, so once you put them on it's kind of a commitment. You have to keep them on until you're done practicing. Uh, unlike the koto picks, which are just attached with a uh, leather band here. And you can see that the koto pick is a lot more square, which provides a more distinct and kind of sharper sound, while the gujang pick is a little bit more rounded. There are styles of koto playing in Japan that use a more rounded pick that's similar to this, uh, the Yamada style koto playing, and Okinawan ryukyu koto uh, actually even uses a much more rounded shape, uh, which is different from gagaku as well. But because I am a member of the ikuta style of koto playing, I use these square picks.
So when we compare the Gujang to the Koto, one thing that's immediately noticeable is the fact that the tablature notation is a completely different system. So as you can see here, rather than being written with the kanji numbers, like the Japanese tatefu notation is, Gujang music is written with Arabic numerals. And this is actually the case for all of the instruments that you'll see in a large-scale Chinese instrumental ensemble. There are a lot of different reasons for this, uh, one of them being that among all of the instruments, being able to read different parts is useful both for the composer and arranger and for the performers who are working with a lot of other musicians playing a huge variety of Chinese traditional instruments. But compared to the way that Gujang has been performed historically, this is a pretty big innovation. Um, throughout China, you can find a lot of different styles of Gujang performance, from solo to ensemble, vocal accompaniment, as well as incidental music for dramas or the stage. This is especially noticeable because, relative to the koto, the gujang has often been described by academics more in terms of a folk instrument than an art music instrument. Of course, that divide is kind of complicated and a little messy. The koto, by comparison, was controlled by a fairly small group of elite musicians who had a lot of power because of the system under the shogunate in Japan. The gujang had a lot more diverse types of performance and ensemble that it was used in throughout China. So today you can find Gujang music in a huge variety of different regional styles. If you study at a music school or a university in China nowadays, you'll find that these traditional instruments from a lot of different genres are brought together in a very contemporary way, often using European and American ideas of harmony, chord progressions, so the tuning of the gujang has been largely standardized. You might be able to see some marks that I have on the strings here for making key changes between D and G. But typically, uh, especially in an ensemble, the gujang will be playing in one of those keys. Of course, traditionally there were lots of different ways of tuning the gujang. Another factor that's really contributed to different uh, compositional and performance styles for the gujang is the expansion of the range in the 20th century. Especially when the gujang is playing in an ensemble, these glissandi are sounds that really stand out from the rest of the powerful wind and percussion and string instruments. Kind of like the way that a harp might be used in a European orchestra. Additionally, there are a lot of very subtle uses of left-hand techniques that aren't uh, seen nearly as frequently in the koto. So you might combine tremolos or vibrato with very sharp downward glissandi to get really dramatic and very distinctly Chinese sounding effects. Especially when you're playing two strings in harmony, those pitch bends sound very dramatic. The way that the fingers are used in performance is also very different between the koto and the gujang, partially because of uh, the way that the picks are lie on the fingers. The gujang is performed with much more uh, bending of the fingers, whereas the best sound in the koto is produced by pushing downward really strongly or dropping from above, but in the case of the gujang, this kind of can have the effect of producing some noise. Typically, uh, nowadays, you'll see gujang with 21 strings, which has an increased range and also provides a lot more dynamic and timbral flexibility than the koto, which has a little bit more similar sound across all of the strings. And of course, in contemporary gujang music, you do see the use of the left hand. Sometimes even picks will be used on the left hand to create a lot of different sonorities and even harmonies. Can get some really beautiful sounds in contemporary gujang music. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I hope that you also join us for the next presentation. And again, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if you'd like more information or resources about 
either of these instruments or Japanese or Chinese music in general. We really appreciate you watching this event and uh, having the chance to share our research and work with you. Thank you so much. Hope to see you on campus at West sometime. Bye guys.